Hi everyone, this is ET350 Lecture 10. Uh, what we're going to cover today is a, kind of a review of self-inductance and mutual inductance transient. Um, so we've seen a lot of this before in ET250, but we're going to bring it back up in light of uh, our, our magnetic principle understanding, with, especially with Faraday's law. Okay, so we're going to look at our uh, inductor equation, the self-inductance equation, V equals plus or minus L di dt. And we'll look at how L is dependent on the number of turns squared, the permeability of the core, cross-sectional area, and the length. Um, we'll look at a brief transient review just to recall uh, how an inductor behaves uh, when you just give it a step voltage. And then we'll look at a mutual inductance. So we'll start our discussion on transformers. And again, Faraday's law is going to come to the picture. You've seen, you've seen some of this before with the dot convention. Well, uh, something new is we're going to show how do we set up the dot convention. But then again, we'll review the sign. You guys have seen this before, but it's been a year. So hopefully this is a good review. And then look at the similar, similarity between the mutual inductance and the self-inductance. It's dependent on mu as well, n1 and n2, a over l. So it's a very similar relationship. And then we'll do some examples to kind of bring it home. But uh, why don't we start? Okay. So self-inductance, again, plus or minus, the same plus or minus that we do for Ohm's law for power. You look at the current direction and you see, is it going to the positive terminal? If it is, you use positive, otherwise you use the negative, right? L is uh, the inductance. We, use, we have Henry's H. And uh, here's a, just a review of the sign. The sign does matter. And uh, again, here, arrow is going to the positive terminal. Arrow is leaving the positive terminal. You get the plus and minus, right? Um, and don't forget, an inductor is just literally a, a piece of wire wrapped around in coils. That's it. Very simple construction. And uh, what it wraps around, the, the permeability of that material is the permeability that we put into this equation. So this L is this L. N is the number of turns. A is this cross-sectional area and L is the stack height, right? And so you can see as I decrease L, I actually get a bigger inductance. If I get more turns, it's very sensitive to the number of turns. So the more turns I can get, so if I double the number of turns, I actually quadruple the uh, self-inductance, okay? Uh, let's just look at where this L equals N squared mu A over L comes from, right? Um, it actually comes from Faraday's law. So let's review what's Faraday's law. V equals N D phi dt. Let's ignore the sign for now because we just want to see where this uh, inductance comes from. Um, so you have a voltage in induced, you have a conductor, right, where the voltage is induced, and then N D phi dt. Well, we kind of, we have a similar situation going on here. Let's recall our definition of flux. Remember one of the seven fundamentals, V equals BA cosine theta. Uh, let's assume like, well, we know when we have current flowing into here, we're gonna create a, a B, right? And then we have this cross-sectional area. So you can imagine that the B created here and the A are gonna be aligned. So theta equals zero. So this term just goes to one and it's constant. We have Ampere's law for a coil, B equals mu NI over L, right? more current, more flux density. So more current flowing through here, it creates a flux density. Good, no problem. So we can punch that into there and then take a derivative. So what do we have? If I take B, put it here, mu n i over L times A times one, because this is just one, and take the time derivative of this, that's gonna help us understand what's going on in the B. And notice the N and the N, that's where we're gonna get this N squared. So if I take a time derivative and assume everything's constant except for that current, like I can turn up and down this current, I get mu n a over l times di dt, right? And if we look and inspect this equation, so we started from Faraday's law, definition of flux and Ampere's law, and, and took a time derivative, squished them together, notice it's the same equation as this one. And if I were to mat, do a pattern match, I can see the n squared mu a over l is the l, so we just you know, call this the constant that magnifies a di dt to v, right? So the sign, we'll, we'll talk about where the sign comes from, the plus or minus, but we call this the inductance. And now you can see where it comes from based on the seven fundamentals that we learned at the beginning of the class, all right? Kind of interesting, all right? So now let's look at the sign. And the sign comes from that same kind of uh, uh, analysis we do, right? The passive sign convention where we, we go, okay, plus, minus all this, right? We just take it for granted. But why don't we go again and just explore where does that come from? And again, it comes from that Lenz's law, Faraday's law analysis that we do. Okay, so let's imagine we have an inductor. We have current flowing through the inductor. 
okay? And we could measure this V. So this V is just measured, right? And so this V, like I say, I put, I'm putting a, a black and red lead it's like this, okay? It's not a source, it's just a measurement. Now this current's coming in. If this current is positive, we're gonna create a flux density that goes up by that Ampere's law right-hand rule, good. Okay, now let's assume everything's steady state, everything is constant, no problem. And we know from an inductor, if your di dt is zero, then your v is zero, right? All right, if you're dc or steady state, I should put steady state actually. Steady state, okay? All right, now let's say we start increasing the current. Di dt is positive, right? Some it, This is like attached to some source and you're increasing the current, right? So instead of the current being a flat line constant, it starts ramping up. Okay, now let's see what's gonna happen. If this I goes up, this B wants to go up too, right? And we recall from Faraday's law and Lenz's law, it does not like that change, remember? Uh, so it, 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 Faraday's law, Lenz's law, induces a B opposed in the opposite direction. It's fighting this increase in B. And then to support that B opposed, Ampere's law kicks in to support it to create a current going the other way. Notice this current is in the opposite direction of the increasing I, that should make sense. The B opposed, the I induced is always in a direction that opposes whatever made that change in the first place. So if I wanted current going this way and I increased it, well, you're gonna get a resistance to that, right? So that I induced is going up, okay? All right, so then if we think about it, again, we're measuring this with this V, right? Okay, if that makes sense. We're measuring these two terminals with my multimeter. If I take this current here, this I induced current, which is the def defined as positive charge flow, I'm building up positive charge on this side, right? That positive charge on this side is going to make this V positive, right? So what we see is V is greater than zero, right? So hopefully that helps support where uh, the situation where if I have current going here, plus V, I'm measuring plus V on this side. And if I have a positive di dt, I'm gonna have a positive V here. And so that supports the positive version of our inductor equation, all right? Okay, um, this is similar to the back EMF in the motors, right? Remember back EMF again is coming from Faraday's law. So all, all everything is, uh, has, has a connection back to those seven fundamentals, right? Now, just to, uh, uh, an idea, what if you, um, what if you switch the windings? You might say, well, like we didn't switch the polarity. We kept the V positive over here. We kept the I going down into it, right? So we still maintain this from the symbol. But let's say instead of wrapping it, uh, uh, what do you call it, front to back, we wrapped it back to front. Would it change the behavior? The answer is no. You would still get the V equals positive LDIDT. That better not change, right? But what would change is the internal magnetic field and all the I induced stuff. That's gonna change. But you're gonna get kind of like a double negative so that this end result is still the same. So let's look at what happens. So notice I still have current going down. I still have it going into the positive terminal. So I still want this. But notice how I've wrapped it here. I've wrapped it around the front, around the back. Here I've wrapped it around the back to the front, okay? In this case, we'll do the same analysis. We'll assume current is uh, constant. So we're going to get a B going down in this case. Good. If I do the same game, play the same game where I increase the current here to get a positive DI dt, what happens? Well, if this B is trying to get bigger, what happens is that you get a B opposed that tries to fight it. The B opposed that tries to fight it, you get an I induced to support that B opposed by Ampere's law, and then what? It creates a current that spirals around this way, but notice it again fights the eye just like this one fights the initial eye. And so you get positive charge build up here. And again, still V is greater than zero. So you still have that uh, positive positive, right? But you kind of get this, uh, what do you call it? A double negative. The B opposed goes up, but the I induced goes the other way, right? So uh, hopefully you can see consistency. Now, if I were to flip the V, like keep I going down and flip the V polarity, right? You're still getting positive charge buildup over here, but now if you were to read it off the multimeter, then you would get a negative number, and hence that would support the negative version of 
your self-inductance, right? Because then it would be like flipping the current or flipping the voltage, just one of them, all right? So hopefully this analysis helps justify where the passive sign convention comes from for the inductor. Okay, cool. All right, um, and if we recall the hydro analogy for an inductor, what do we say? It's like a water wheel. It doesn't like a change of state. That's exactly what Faraday's law, Lenz's law says. It doesn't like a change of state. And so hopefully that's consistent. And if we were to take the same inductor and then put it in series with a resistor and a voltage source, and let's say at this point, uh, what do we got? We got I equals going to the positive V, so it's gonna be the positive LDIDT. Let's say no current's flowing and I close the switch. Well, what happens to the voltage? The voltage uh, is gonna try to jump, right? The current is going to try to jump. If it was a resistor, bang, this current and voltage would immediately jump, right? But what happens? The current is going to have this, uh, it can't, the, the flow cannot instantaneously jump, so it will eventually get to Vs over R because eventually this voltage will go to zero. But in the instant, in the instant that you close the switch, this voltage jumps up and goes, no way, I do not want to change this current. So just after you close the switch, you have actually no current and then it goes, okay, fine, fine. And it releases and this voltage droops down and closes, goes close to, to zero, but the I comes up and now this thing behaves like a short, okay? All right, now what does the voltage do here? Well, the voltage, like I said, jumps immediate, spikes up to whatever value this uh, is, right? So you have equal pressures on this side, therefore no current, but then it gives away and falls off, decays to zero. Okay, so I hope this is a review of all those transient first order differential equations that you brought up. And of course, you could you could do this, uh, you know, crunch out, you know, V equals L D I D T, I R, V S, do a little KVL, solve a first order differential equation. The other thing you could do, you could put it into the, the simulator, the false set simulator, and actually see what happens to the current voltage as you ping this. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Now let's move into to transformers because a transformer is just a combination of two inductors or more, right? If it's a three-phase transformer. And I think we'll talk about some three-phase transformers um, later on in this uh, uh, course, okay? Now we have not, we've talked about the dot convention. We use the dot convention to determine the sign for mutual inductance, but we never talked about how to set up the dots, right? Right now, we're going to talk about how do you set up the dots and what you need to do is you need to be able to see the individual coil wraps around the core in order to be able to set up the dots. If you just see the symbol, like if you just are able to see this, you cannot set up the dots. That's going to be difficult, right? But if you actually see the wrappings, then you can set up the dots. And the way you set up the dot is if, the, if you had some test currents were to enter their dots, the flux due to Ampere's law will be in the same direction. Okay, so these test currents are not the actual current that's going, you know, like the reference currents. And you'll see what I'm talking about later. These are just test currents, right? So just if there were to be a current that enters the dot side, then you'd want the flux going in the same direction. So notice we have a transformer core, right? Notice we have, we can see the way the coils are wrapped around. And notice this current, this test current is entering the dot. So I have a left test current, a right test current. And by Ampere's law, right, the current goes in, I can use my right hand rule, look, the flux or B is gonna go up in this case. And over here, you can say, if my test current were to enter on this side in, in this dot, then by Ampere's law, I would see that the flux on both sides are going in the same direction. Good, the dots are set up correctly, right? Let's look at this one. Uh, notice the coils are wrapped in the same direction here, but here they're reversed. And so the dot is probably gonna go on the bottom on this side. So put the test current in, yep, that's right. Now here, double check, dot, put the test current in, yep, okay, going down. Notice the fluxes are both in the same direction. Again, kind of like a double negative, right? What did we do here? We uh, flipped the coil direction, but also flipped the dots, right? Okay, so here's the easiest process to set up a dot. If you see blank coils, right, no coils here, the easy way to do is you just pick a dot on one side, you check the flux, then, you choose the dot on the other side to match the flux. If you choose the dot incorrectly, well, you just choose the other side. Easy, right? So this is a super simple process, okay? Okay, now when you do have the dot set up, this is review from ET250. These are your mutual inductance equations. 
V1 equals the self-inductance plus or minus L1 di1 dt. So that's on the left side or right side, depending. And then you have plus or minus MDI2 dt. So that's the current from the other side affecting this voltage. Then you have V2 equals L2 di2 dt. That's the voltage self-inductance on one side. And then plus or minus MDI1 dt from the other current affecting this voltage, right? So this should be a review from 250. This, these signs are easy. You just use your typical passive sign convention on its own self-inductance. This one you have to, once you know the dots, then you can use the dots to determine the signs, right? So for the upper right quadrant here, it's positive if the I2, the opposite side, enters the dot and V1 positive touches the dot. Or if I2 leaves the dot, and V1 negative touches the dot. Those will both result in positive, negative otherwise. And it's the same rule for here, right? Um, yes, if you haven't done this in a while, you might have forgotten these rules, no problem. You do a few examples, it'll just come right back. Okay, so let's do an example here. This hopefully will hit it home. So I have an example here where I go, okay, we wanna set up the dots, and we want to write the mutual inductance equations, right? So let me, let me just redraw this slowly so that, you know, we can do this in kind of real time instead of just flashing the slide. So I'm going to carefully redraw the coils and redraw the coils. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm not even going to put V1, I1, V2, I2 here. I just want to set up the dots because if I put V1, I1, V2, I2, I might confuse that with my test currents, right? So if I look at this, I go, okay, I'm just gonna arbitrarily pick a dot. Let's see what happens. So if I have a dot, I'm gonna put an I test, completely independent from I1. Don't even worry about I1, I2, V1, V2 right now. So I test, what's gonna happen? I have here, check my Ampere's law, flux going this way, okay. Now I want to set up the dots, I want flux to go this way. So which way would the current have to be to get flux to go in this direction? I want it to be going like so, is that right? So it looks like I would need to put a dot here to get current, a test current, to enter that dot, to go in this way and create flux going the same direction, easy. So the two dots should be here and here. By the way, would that be equivalent to having two dots here and here? It sure would. So those are equivalent. Two dots on the top is the same as two dots on the bottom, right? Two dots on the diagonal is the same as two dots on the other diagonal, okay? All right. So here's the mutual inductance equations. Boom, no problem. We set up the dot convention. So we pick our dots and notice this is exactly what I just did. Notice you don't even worry about I1, V1, I2, V2. You just worry about I test. That's gonna be an important part about setting up the dots. Ignore I1 and I2 when you do this. Okay, great, got the dot set up. Now, once we have the dot set up and we wanna find the sign, now you ignore the test currents and now you only look at I1, I2, V1, V2. Okay, the self-inductance is gonna be easy for this one, right? If I look at this, ignoring the test current, I1 is entering the positive terminal V1 easy. So that's gonna be positive. Okay, let's look at this side. For the self-inductance here, I2, ooh, I2 is leaving the positive terminal, so that's gonna be negative. So I'm gonna have a positive negative. And so I should see that here. Good, positive and negative, perfect. Okay, now let's look at what are we gonna get for the sign for this one, right? This right corner. So what do we have? We wanna look at I2. Is I2 leaving the dot? It sure is. But V1 positive is touching its dot. Mm, that's gonna be a negative, okay? Right, that's gonna be a negative. Because if I2 leaves this dot, V1 negative would have had to touch its dot to be positive, okay? Not too bad. What about this one here? What is I1 doing? I1 is entering the dot, okay? and V2 positive is touching the dot. Okay, that means it's positive. I1 enters the dot and V2 positive touches the dot, positive. Great, positive, not too bad. So this part you've done before, so uh, creating the dots is not a very hard thing, but that's kind of new, okay? Like I said here, I'm gonna repeat it again. Do not confuse the test currents for when you set up the dots with the I1 and I2. Easy mistake for students to make, don't make it. All right. Let's keep moving on. Now, what is this M term? What is this L term? Well, we, we already know what the L terms is. We just talked about it. It comes from Faraday's law. The M term also comes from Faraday's law, and it's very similar. It's mu N1, N2, A over L, where L is mu N squared A over L, right? And N1, N2 are the number of turns of each of the coil. 
And you're, you are making some, some assumptions. You're assuming they both have the same stack height, the same cross-sectional area, and the same permeability, shared permeability of the core, okay? All right. And uh, this is just a little mini proof by, you know, visual proof of where this M turn comes from and why, why it uh, has this uh, similar feel as the other one. Well, let's look at this situation. Actually, this, this is a good situation to, to analyze. So you have, um, you have a transformer core, okay? And uh, let's, let's just double check what's going on. This is kind of uh, not exactly the same as, as this, uh, this setup here. But let's just confirm that this equation is correct. So we have a core, sure. We have two coils, sure. We have I1, V1 set up, I2, V2 set up. And oh, they actually gave us the dots. Okay, so they gave us the dots. Um, we can make sure that the dots are actually drawn correctly. If I had a test current going into this dot, according to the way this is round, yep, it looks like phi would go up. If I had a test current going to the dot, phi would also go up. Good. So it looks like the dots are set up correctly. Let's see what the sign. I1 is going to the positive terminal. Okay, that's positive. I2 is going to the positive terminal. That's positive. Did that? Yep. Positive, positive. Great. Um, let's check the sign for the mutual duct. So uh, I1, uh, sorry, let's look at I2 first. I2 is going into its dot and V1 positive is touching its dot. That sounds like a positive. Good. And I1 going is going into its dot and V2 positive is touching its dot. Positive. Good. Okay. So this is correct. This is all correct. It's consistent with the dot convention for setting up the dots and it's consistent with the sign. Great. Now, where does this M come from, right? Now, the M still comes from Faraday's law. And so we already talked about how this is from Faraday's law, but what about this one? Well, remember V equals N D phi D T. So let's just look at the first coil. So you're getting its self inductance, but you're also getting the number of turns of the first one from the D phi D T from the second coil. That's why I put an N one D phi two D T, right? Because this is generating its own change in flux, right? That's how transformers work is that you get a flux change from the other coil affecting its this guy. So that's, that's the really cool thing about transformer and Faraday's law, Lenz's law is the reason why it works. So we have N1 D phi 2 DT. So it's the other coil affecting this one for V1. Okay. What was phi 2 again? Definition of flux phi 2 equals B A cosine theta. We'll assume the cosine theta is one, just like before. Again, we can put the Ampere's law in mu N2 I2 over L2. Okay. So that's this current Ampere's law, good. And so now we take a time derivative, just like we did before, mu N2, A over L2, di T D T, assuming all these other guys are constant, and then plug that back into here. And look at this, you have an N1, N2, mu N1, N2, A over L2, di T D T. And if you assume all the Ls are the same, right? Look at this, that just becomes mu N1, N2, A over L, right? Assume the cross-sectional area is the same and the, the lengths are the same, so the stack heights. Nice, nice. So hopefully this shows you how Faraday's law, Lenz's law, Ampere's law is again being used over and over in this class to show us where these equations come from, right? Where the, and we'll talk about also where that sign comes from in a later lecture, all right? Um, for now, let's do some examples and then we'll end it. So let's just do this one simple example. And it's, this is kind of a, what do you call it? A toy problem. It doesn't, uh, what I wanna do is do the example and uh, also show where this is not actual reality. Well, the answer that uh, you get wouldn't be actual reality. So let's look at it. You have a, a transformer thing going on. They've given you the dots, right? They haven't given you the coils, like. You, they don't let you see like what the individual coils are doing. So that means that they, they got to give you the dots, right? They give you some uh, polarities and current directions, no problem. They tell you that this is shorted and you have a voltage source that hasn't been switched over yet. Now we know that the voltage across the short is zero. Great. They give you the L values and the M values. Great. And they want you to sketch I1 and I2 as a function of time. Well, you can imagine right now if the switch opened, everything is zero, no problem. I1 is zero, I2 is zero, okay? Um, but they say at t equals zero, the switch is closing. Okay, so what happens when the switch closes? So when the switch closes, this is gonna allow current to flow, right? And you can imagine that 
this is going to want to increase, right? You're going to first have the self-inductance behavior was boom. I don't like the voltage, but then it's going to give away, right? Kind of thing. So this current is going to actually increase. Now, if I get a change in current on this side due to um, uh, the transformer action, the mutual inductance action, you're going to get a DI1 DT. You're going to induce currents on this side. Now, this will be zero, but you're going to induce a DI2 DT on this side. Okay. All right, so let's let's just punch it and see what happens, right? Um, do we get the mutual inductance of signs correct? Let's double check. I goes in, I1 goes into V1, good. I2 goes into V2, good. I2 goes into its dot and V1 positive touches its dot, yay. I1 goes into the dot and V2 positive touches its dot, yay. So exactly the same equations as this one, that's kind of nice. All right, let's just punch in the values. V1, so once I close this, V1 is now seeing by KVL is in 12 volts and V2 is zero volts. Okay, great. So I can now put these equations in here and I get 12, zero, and then I can put these values in here. Okay, that's not too bad. Now let's see what the consequence of this equation, the simultaneous set of equations gives us. Well, we can see, look, we have DI2 equals negative 0.5 over 10 di1 dt okay i could take this answer and substitute back in here and i get 12 equals 0.1 di1 dt plus 0.5 times this guy this guy pops into here and that means it tells me what the slope is for di1 dt the slope of di1 dt is a positive 160 amps per second okay so that means this is is positive and increasing at a rate of 160 amps per second, okay? Now, what about di2 dt? Well, I take this answer and I plug it in here and I get negative eight amps per second. So actually this current is going the other way, right? It's going the other way um, at eight amps per second, all right? So what does that look like on a plot? What that looks like on a plot is this. They both started at zero. They both started at zero. So let me put that here so you can see all three. Um, di1 dt has a positive slope of 160 amps per second and di2 dt has a negative slope of 8 amps per second all right so what that says is this thing closes and this thing just starts increasing its current Brrr, keeps going now notice there's no resistive elements we didn't model any resistive elements in here and that's not true obviously in real life we're going to have some if there's wires it's going to have some internal resistance but what it's saying these are like perfect superconductor materials this current i1 would keep increasing 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 to infinity right because what happens to inductor in steady state what does it behave like in our ideal world it behaves like a short right so this would just keep increasing right same with this one if this is by that mutual inductance action, if this is, if you have a constant DIDT of increasing current, this is going to have a, a voltage and current increase, right? Okay, and now we said the voltage is zero, but you're gonna get a DI2 DT, right? And that's from this relationship here. Okay, and so this would keep going to negative infinity. Now, in reality, there is gonna be a resistive element. So let's think, let's try to imagine what's gonna happen in reality. So if there is a resistive element, what I would imagine happening is that the DI1 DT is gonna do this, just like we saw in the transient behavior. This is your I1, this is time, okay? And then what would we see on the I2? Well, we would probably see this, right? Just like you have here, this. So this behavior and this behavior would match this. But eventually, once this steadies out, what is the DI1 DT? it's equal to zero over here. Well, if this equals zero, then the di2 dt equals zero as well, right? Okay, but also not only that, since the voltage two is equal to zero, this is gonna come back and steady out, right? And steady out to nothing. There's gonna be no transference of energy back over here, right? Because what's gonna happen is this is zero, this is zero and so this is going to have to come back right and so eventually i would say that this i2 especially if there's a resistor on this side is going to increase but then it's going to have to flatten out to zero somehow right because you can't just keep maintaining current in here there'd be no a, a transformer action
Okay. Now what we're going to look now, typically you don't run transformers like this. Typically you run them as AC steady state, right? So this is oscillating. So therefore this is oscillating. But when you do turn a transformer on, you will get these kind of like spikes, right? So just some things to think about. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you learned something. I hope it showed us how the uh, Faraday's law, Lentz's law, Ampere's law, definition of flux, those seven fundamentals are coming back in and helping us describe some of the things we just took for granted and assumed were true in your previous 250 classes. All right, have a great day and we'll see you in class.